<laughs> Good morning everybody and welcome to Wild Earth this morning over here in South Africa. I'd love to say sunny South Africa but we have got a little bit of cloud here this morning so I'm hoping that it's going to stay a little bit warmer than maybe on some of the days when there's no cloud and hopefully we might see some more animals in the first hour or so of drive than what we've been used to in the past few days. My name is Tara and joining me on camera this morning is Herman and back in final control is Craig. So if you would like to send us through any questions, please do. It's always great to hear from you. And send them through to questions at wildearthsafari.tv. So that's questions at wildearthsafari.tv. And let us know where you're from in the world as well. It's always great to know. But let's jump aboard. We have seen some of the Impala. I'm just going to get a little bit closer for those people who may have joined us for the first time and never seen an Impala before. And then I would like to head down towards the down because there's a few birds calling down there. So it'll be interesting to see what it is that's, caught, that's making them call. And it's actually quite misty here this morning. I think somebody was asking just as I was leaving for this open area if it was smoke or whether it was fog. And you tend to get fog more around the, the coastal regions. It tends to get termed mist when you're this far inland. And there's a lot of it in the valley. Good morning, mister. Shame. You can see the bachelor group very close to the breeding groups now. Now that the rutting is pretty much over, there's been one or two males still, still stating their claim area but on the whole everything's settling down now And just in case there was a few people that are joining us today that haven't heard, the little female cub who went missing after Mafufanyam was down at Treehouse Dam, she is alive and well. She was seen two days ago now, walking down Voyatella Access with her mother. I'm sure there's quite a number of relieved people out there. <laughs> This is one of the most numerous antelope and you generally do find some impala on nearly every drive. It's very, very unusual not to find impala. But they are such a beautiful antelope and when you think of an antelope, for me, this is exactly what I would think of. They've just got all the grace and elegance. Although their voice not quite matching what they look like, especially when they are going through the rutting season. Now there is a male approaching and he is actually approaching quite aggressively. See his head's up, his ears are back, and the other male just walking to the side there, even smacking his lips with his tongue. And his male sort of being a bit defiant there. He's squaring off there now. Actually, I think he just won that little bit debate. Can you see he actually went higher? He actually held his head much higher than the one that just walked behind him. And yet, the one that walked behind him held his head much higher than the one that walked past him. So there's a bit of bit of a mini power play going on there. So even when they're in the bachelor groups like that, there will still be a hierarchy. <laughs> but apart from 
from that, it all seems quite subtle. <laughs> it's been a lot of hyena activity. And what I would like to do is catch up with those baboons. But they're still tucked up in the trees at the moment. So let's go down to the dam, see if there's anything happening around there. Let's see if we can time it right to come back and just check in with the baboons. So we have yet to really see and count them properly. We've seen them on a couple of occasions. But they've all been either tucked up in the trees or hidden away in the bushes in bad, very bad lighting. down and have a look. I think it might be worth us trying to check out, oh there we go, the room's already on the march. I'm sure I just saw somebody walking along the road. I thought it was my imagination. There you go, there's Tagman. And looks like all the ladies. There's Shirley. Genesis. Well, actually, it looks like that was Gordy and not LB. Um, this is Psycho with Evelyn just behind. I'm going to turn around and hopefully we can get them carrying on down the, down the road. Oh, they do sleep behind the, uh, the fence of the owner of Juma Game Reserve. Let's pick some trees there hide away in uh, overnight when they do sleep up here. Sometimes they sleep down in the south or in the west. More so down in the south than the west. I think they've overnighted a couple of times that side. I'm just going to try and give them a bit of a wide berth. They're a little bit more comfortable with us. So that's why we're seeing a fence, unfortunately. At the moment, there's not too much I can do about it. It does look like there's only four today. Gordy, Miss, uh, Mrs. P, Shirley, and Tankman. Tankman being the dominant male. Now, LB is the lowest ranking member of the troop, so she generally will be the last to, to be in the troop. Sometimes she'll lead the way, which is quite, quite unusual but I have seen her sort of take the lead, especially when she goes home to the trees. But she doesn't look like she's there this morning. She was there a couple of days ago. 
And little Huey is also missing. There's little Genesis. So something funny is going on with this baboon troop. And we know quite a lot about them. So I'm still learning. <laughs> They have been studied for a good eight, eight years or so by the same person. So he got to know the characters and he was all, also accepted into the troupe. And has moved away now, but he will keep coming back sporadically. So hopefully he can check in with them again. I think he's due to come back in Ju uh, July again. And I think that bond is pretty strong in that when he does come back, they do seem to recognise him straight away. But when he first started studying them, there was quite a large number of them, maybe about 50 or 60 or so. And then they split. And where they go down to the south, that's where the troops split. And it could be that when they split again, when I first arrived, there was about 13 of them. And they split again about six, seven, eight months ago, something like that. And again, half of them just disappeared. I'm wondering what happened to the others. Land display. There's huge canines, and these male baboons are pretty much a force to be reckoned with. with those huge canines. You don't want to be getting on the wrong side of those. Oh, thanks, Mike. Mike just saying the hippos are active at the dam. We'll definitely see if we can make a turn down there. And it's it's definitely useful. If anybody spots anything on the camera, then definitely let us know via email. Because we don't always monitor it these days. If anybody has seen anything overnight, if you can let us know and let us know what time it was seen as well, it gives us an idea of where these animals might have moved to, maybe the direction that you saw them moving into. You can maybe go down and look for tracks of that animal. Or even if you heard lions calling, it's always great to know. Or even leopard or hyena. Ooh fight breaking out there. Now that must be surely that's mating again. We did just see Tankman mating with her. Oh no, that is LB. Okay, that was LB. So LB is here. I was thinking, I don't remember seeing Shirley. <laughs> Shirley a couple of days ago looking like that. Oh, so maybe that's who they were waiting for. LB was just taking the time. 
But LB is here. LB meaning left behind. And there's Gordy. I think Gordy actually went just to check her. You might find that bit of behaviour a little bit strange. Is that being Tech and Gordy? I'm just going to turn around again. Yeah. See, so, you now she's ahead of the troop. So I always find quite interesting. That Mrs. Psycho is off towards the right hand side. But they're pretty much following where she's going. Here's Tank Man. And little Genesis and his mum Shirley. Shirley and Tank Man seem to be very, very close. You see that that bond there, she tends to stay very close to him. Even when she doesn't have a baby, but as I said earlier, those canines are certainly a force to be reckoned with, and if there's any trouble, then the females who have a good relationship with some of the, the dominant males will step in usually and, and help defend the babies because probably most of the time those babies are going to be theirs. But as I was just saying, the two males, Tang Man, looking like he was mating with Gordy there. But that's when it's two males like that, it's, it's usually a sign of dominance. You'll often see in other species of males fight if they've been sparring then you'll often see the dominant male actually then trying to practice covering the other male if he's fairly young or if it's a fr an older bull it's, as I say it's a sign of dominance there so that's what that was about so Gordy just submitting to Tang Man just making sure that he's still aware. Yes, I know I'm lower ranking than you are. And there they go. Quite interesting. They're actually waiting for LB to catch up to them, I think. So still no Huey. Still no Huey. It looks like they are starting to forage a little bit, so let's just have another If you notice, they are walking on the ground, and they are a terrestrial monkey, spending most of their day on the ground foraging for food, or between trees. And this is when they are most vulnerable, and this is when they really do need the protection of those males. Concerned, but certainly very wary of where we are, so I'm just keeping my distance this morning from them.
amazing to think that little one's probably about six months old now. <laughs> Looks like they're going to go and feed in the tree just opposite us. <coughs> Let's see if we can just get a little bit closer. We might be able to see the youngsters playing in the trees. And never underestimate how powerful a baboon is. There is some sheer strength there. Even though they're probably, especially the females, no bigger than height-wise a Labrador. And a small Labrador at that. Almost as if they're actually picking that tree, see if they can get a better look at the sun. Hi Mary, good morning to you. Wanting to know, is Tangman, or has he always been the dominant male over the years and how old is he? And I think Graham said he was probably around eight or nine if I can remember it, he was saying rightly. Because he was very young when he first started watching the baboons. I say, when he first arrived, I think it was, around, it was about ten when he first started watching it was about 10 years but when he actually started studying them properly it was probably about 8 years 
And the reason why it's called Tank Man is because he used to play on the water tanks, actually in the garden where we've just been, where you saw the fence. I used to love lying on those tanks and playing on the tanks. That's where he got his name from. But he's not always been the dominant male, and actually he's, he's quite a small male compared to other males that we've seen in the troop. And as I was saying earlier, when the troop split, and when there was about 13 of them when I first arrived, there was a couple of other males, Barry and Tupac. And Barry was actually a little bit larger than Tank Man. You see where those baboons have gone now. There's still a couple in the tree. I can just move around a little bit more. So Tank Man has actually ended up being the dominant male almost by default. There he is, is it there actually? And I think probably about July, August, I think there was actually three other males and one of them was huge. He was called uh, Darth Vader by Graham and he really was massive and there was a couple of other males and at one point each female was paired with one of the males which is quite unusual in baboon society but they all kind of paired off and as I say something happened something they they almost filtered off over couple of months and do it new additions to the troop left and then Barry ended up I think he had quite a, a nasty cut on his leg which was healing but he was then almost kicked out of the group he was always on the sort of periphery of the of the group as they moved the little Genesis here is most likely Tank Man's, and so is little Evelyn. He's really been the only dominant male with the troop for a decent amount of time. So Evelyn might not be. Evelyn might still be one of the other males. I think it could possibly be Tank Man's. I think Evelyn's just under a year old now. Hi Annie, welcome to you this morning. You were looking at LB's rump a little bit earlier, wanting to know what's going on with it. Is it uh, sores or is it hemorrhoids? And it does look very painful and I'm, I must admit I wouldn't like to be a female baboon. But when they cycle, when they come into estrus, that's how they show the males that they're ready to mate. And that apparently is very attractive to the males. And the redder it is and the more swollen it is, 
the more interesting it is. So it's actually LB wanting to mate. And LB, she's she's actually been quite desperate to have her own young. Apparently, uh, I think it was actually Shirley, if I remember Graham saying correctly, when she had one of her young a little while ago, just over a year ago. And LB was always wanting to play with it. She was always grooming it and, you know, almost sort of trying to steal it away from her. And she was absolutely desperate to have her own young. And unfortunately, she has fallen pregnant a few times. And she's had two babies so far. But unfortunately, those babies have passed away. And they don't seem to get older than a few months. And I actually thought she, she'd actually been mated fairly soon after her last, last one died. She actually started mating probably about two or three months later. So I'm hoping third time lucky for her, but she hasn't. She doesn't seem to have fallen pregnant yet. Good morning to you, Caroline, and I'm sure a few people also wanted to know how Mrs. Psycho got her name. Well, uh, we have had Graham on a couple of fireside chats, and he's uh, certainly quite a quirky man, and uh, quite a big character himself, and uh, it's quite funny how he, c he came up with some of these names. Uh, Mrs. Psycho, apparently, when he was trying to introduce himself to the group, now what he did would just sit there, and he wouldn't try and make contact with them. And eventually some of the troop members kind of accepted him and maybe started coming towards him. But unfortunately, Mrs. Psycho was one of the few that was still very wary of him. And he said she used to give him this look that he wasn't overly happy with. And she looked like she was on kind of on a nice edge and she could, uh, she could attack at any moment. <laughs> But uh, I think over the years she actually did start to, to uh, accept him and, and uh, I do remember watching him with them a few times and she was fairly, fairly relaxed around him which was good. Genesis watching us. <laughs> now the two little ones will pick up on what to fear and what not to fear from the adults. So as long as the adults are giving them good signals with us, then they'll learn not to not to worry about us. <laughs> he goes up the tree now. <laughs> Yeah. 
you do seem to find when they are <coughs> foraging for food one of them will just take high ground, maybe it's on a termite mound, maybe it's in a tree, and keep watch over the troop. Now with a larger troop you might find a couple of them doing that, but this troop's quite a small troop. In some troops you can get maybe 60, 80, sometimes even up to 100 or so. And then you will find there's more dominant males within that group or troop. LB again, playing with Genesis now. You can see she's actually displaying, she's trying to encourage a mating. And Tangman again seems to be the more desirable of the two males, but I think she has accepted Gordy before. And I think that was actually Shirley who she was displaying to. Now I think she also wants to be good friends with Shirley because I think Shirley is actually the dominant female and in baboon society relationships are very important. Now again with this being quite a small troop it's maybe not as important as larger troops because there's only a few members that can pick on you kind of thing. But in a large troop you'll find friendships being formed where especially low ranking individuals to try and get higher ranking individuals to be friends with and they need those in case they are getting beaten up by other members of the, of the group and if they given a, a cry and a, a, a cry to say they need help those friends may just step in and, and actually stop them attacking their friend and males can be sneaky as well there could be some males that form friendships with females even though they may not be the parents of the babies. It could be that they're actually hoping to get a mating next time round when she's in estrus, and it could be that she's a high ranking female and he's fairly low ranking. So they will <coughs> strike up this friendship and they may even come and rescue the baby if it's in trouble, even if it's not his, for that possibility to, to mate next time with that particular female. So it's actually it's a lot more complicated than I think what we give them credit for. But even in a small troop it's still important to have friends in, in high places. And unfortunately for LB she is the lowest ranking. fairly settled. So let's continue on our safari and see what else we can go and find this morning. <laughs> Check this side of the open area for any tracks. Actually, we were greeted. Came in from leave three or four days ago now by the sight of a white tailed mongoose, which is always great to see. There's 
there's been one running around here and there's some similar tracks here. About this long a body, beautiful long white tail, nice and bushy, like that of a fox almost. Yeah, it's been walking around here. It may even be out and about this morning. When you've got an overcast day like this, quite often you can be lucky enough to see a nocturnal animal still out and about foraging. Okay, so let's head down towards Gary Dam, have a quick look around there. Let's see if any birds are still active. sitting on the branch shouting. Well, I think we'll head round towards Impala Plains. So apparently it looked like Karula possibly dropped the cubs off by Orbeez Road and left them to head south towards Impala Plains. So let's have a look around Gary Dam first. What's going on around there? I'm not too sure where the elephant herd was left. Elephants can travel quite vast distances overnight and during the day. Sometimes I'll do a little loop in the area. So it's possible to find elephants pretty much in the same place, especially during the summertime when there's plenty of food. But as we're going, well, we're actually, I think we had the official first day of winter a few, a few days ago. So as we are now officially in winter, it's uh, going to be a slightly different story because they are going to start travelling greater distances to go and find right amount of food each day and night. And the same goes really for most animals. Uh, good morning to you Anne. Welcome on board this morning. Wanting to know what the average age of a blue is. It's got some blue fowl here. A little bit. That's why they're running away. <laughs> I can't speak any foul, sorry. I still hear the goose calling though. Well, if memory serves me correctly, Anne can reach about 20, maybe 25 years old, sometimes 30 if they're lucky. Okay guys, what's been going on down here? There's the geese. Here and just scan the area. See what they're complaining about. So with the geese, it could be anything. It could be another Egyptian goose. <laughs> there they go. shouting as loud as I've heard them with other animals but it could be an eagle flying over, it could be an eagle in a tree it 
could be a predator on the ground. But I think with them flying off, I wonder if they have seen another another goose. And they are highly territorial, so they really oh there comes a goose flying in. Okay, I think it is possibly I can hear them calling. So there goes one goose. And I think here they come. Yeah, so they are flying in after the other goose. There we go. Yep, yeah, just on the right of the screen. Might be able to hear them. They're, they're bonding there now. You can see, sort of almost dancing together, strengthening that pair bond. And they do protect their territory quite aggressively. And that's that single goose has now been seen off. So it's time for them to just strengthen that bond again. The female, if we get it the right way around, the female tends to do the kind of the hissing sound and the male kind of does the honking sound. So that uh, uh, uh is the male. That one that sounds like it's hissing a little bit is the female. So even though there's not really much difference between the two colour wise or even the size wise, oh, there's mummy hippo, baby. Oh, the grey heron too. We we'll see it through between those two grass stalks. So we we'll get too close. Hi Jewel, good morning to you this morning, and I wasn't aware of seeing any smoke yesterday, I have to ask uh, Mark about that, if he saw some smoke, I'm not too sure where the fire was, but we are going into the fire season, uh, apparently it was in the Manuleti north of here, <laughs> thanks Craig, it apparently was in the, in the Manuleti, and as we go, or as we are in winter and the vegetation is drying out, the likelihood of fires does increase quite dramatically. Now, generally fires are needed in this area. And as you rightly ask, will animals start flocking to that burnt air? And generally they will do as the, uh, as the vegetation grows through. But generally that happens just before the rain and just during the rainy season so right at the beginning of the the rainy season and that's when you start to get a lot of fires from sometimes the lightning hitting hitting ground I mean there's still quite a bit of greenery so the fires aren't as much as further into the season there's the baby <laughs> Baby's probably just about a month old. Let's see if it'll pop up again. Looks like it's possibly trying to get onto Mum's back. So especially when the rains fall, you get this sudden new growth sprouting through and it literally is almost within days. And animals will flock to that new growth. But this time of year plants have really stopped growing and, and they've really stopped having nutrients put into into the plants quite often that all the nutrients will be held back in the roots 
or in the stems and they shut down many of the trees will shut down for winters across the world so the likelihood is probably for herbivores not that great to start heading towards the manuleti just yet but if there's carnivores around then they probably will head there to see if there's been any, any casualties from the fires <laughs> Gotta be hard for a baby hippo. Can only imagine. <laughs> a little storm. Oh, nearly. Now you'll often find them trying to get on the mum's backs, try and conserve energy. So they can just sit up there and rest and when mum moves they can just hitch a ride. And funny enough we haven't really seen the terrapins hitching rides on the hippos very much recently. Especially during the summer, you'd often find them sitting out there on their backs. Oh, Cindy wants you to know where the dam cam is. Just in front of us. You can see on the tree there. So anybody watching the Waterhole channel, that's where you're watching from. Being watched by a virtual starling there. So that is the waterhole camera. Looks a little bit different to the old one. I'm fairly close to where we used to have it, probably about two, three meters, maybe three and a half, four meters difference. And I think are the speakers there as well now? Yeah, so the sounds that you hear. Oh, the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Got the right terminology now. <laughs> so the microphone. <laughs> play music to the hippos. <laughs> well, you never know, you might like it. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> the microphone. If you remember where we used to have it, it was actually on that little stump there, just opposite us now. That's where the camera used to be, and the tree is just on the left of your screen now. That's where it is now, so there we go. So the little stump on the right is where it used to be. And the speakers... Oh, the speakers. <laughs> the microphone used to be in the tree, and it's just behind us. So it actually used to be quite a distance from from the camera, and it used to be quite quite strange because you hear a noise and you immediately try and look around the camera, forgetting that the microphone was actually somewhere else. But the tree on the left of your screen now—that's where the camera is now, and the microphone. So if you do hear something, it is because it's around by the camera. Oh, two greenback herons just flew across your screen. I don't know if you. I zoomed out just a little bit too much. I don't think you were able to see them. That's nice. Zoomies keep a look out for the green-backed herons. Still a little bit quiet this morning. Not too much going on. There is starting to get a little bit of a chill as we're going down into the dip here now. You might be able to see some of that mist. A bird just sitting right in the top of the tree there. Can you see it?
Oh, nice. That is the green backed herons I was just talking about. Uh, on the bridge, in between now. Yep, still there. One flew in and chased the other one off. Quite a small heron. It's actually a juvenile with all the streaking on it, and the spots on its wing. That's nice. Nice to know that they're possibly moving in here. Now the herons tend to have a stand and wait method of fishing. And that's one of the reasons why they have such a long bill and usually fairly long legs. But that little guy has a little added extra. And some of the herons do use tricks and this is one of them. And he actually will take a piece of fish as bait to attract the fish to it. Quite ingenious actually. So if it gets a little bit of a fish, the fish will start to come and feed and that's when he can actually then steer the fish instead of having to wait around in the hope that they will swim by eventually. But I'll quickly show you before we move on. This is the juvenile that we've just been seeing. And the adult is right next to it. And that's where they get the name from. You can see these green feathers here. The green backed heron. There's also a few green green feathers on the back. And when you get the adults flying into the sun, you can actually see that shimmer of green quite nicely. Quite small though, underneath the book. The normal herons would stand just a little bit smaller than the person. But the green-backed heron is probably about this sort of height. Maybe with its head stretched out, it may be looking about this sort of height. So quite a small heron. Very nice to see. Hello, talking just now. In a while since we've seen Spike the crocodile. I wonder if it's these two just to our left. It looks like they're squaring off a little bit. Maybe it was those two that were having a little bit of a, a problem with each other. Those look fairly, fairly settled. Uh -huh. What's quite interesting with the hippos is there's probably a lot of talking going on now. And we just not able to hear it. It's inaudible to us. You need a microphone underneath the surface of the water to hear it. 
croaks and clicks and wheezes and all sorts of things that are just happening underneath the surface of the water. Good morning to you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and I'm not going to try it this morning. <laughs> Just for, even for excitement factor, I don't think I will. Elizabeth wants to know what would happen if you found yourself in the water with a hippo. Now, I'm assuming this is if you go swimming and you don't realise that there's a hippo there until you're actually in there with the hippo. But, uh, hippos don't take too kindly to strangers. And uh, you might be lucky, you might have uh, a juvenile hippo, or maybe one that's a little bit more relaxed than most. But, uh, otherwise, yeah, you might end up with a bit of a problem because they're highly territorial in the water. And so much so, if you're standing on the water's edge, you might get a hippo charging out of the water at you just to make sure that they chase you away. Especially a mother with a calf or a territorial bull. I suppose it's one of those, what do you do if there's a shark swimming towards you? You do what you can, I suppose. And I hope I never get in that situation. I've often heard if there's a lion charging at you, his mouth open, he's just about to jump on you. You're supposed to put your, your fist down its throat so it can't actually bite down. I wouldn't want to try that one. Not with a hippo either. <clears throat> so the biting force is pretty strong. And I think your fist is going to be lost down her throat. But probably the only thing you could do is maybe bop it on the nose. <laughs> or on the eye. That's still quite a distance. I think definitely for that one, Elizabeth, prevention is definitely better than cure. <laughs> Just <laughs> don't go swimming in any any water that could contain hippo. Where there's hippos, there's probably also crocodiles. <laughs> like the same sort of water. Fairly slow, slow running, or even in dams like this. Fast running water, you don't tend to find too many hippos. Or even crocodiles for that matter. And then you've got the problem with it probably being rapids. Okay, well, everyone seems pretty relaxed now. So if you want to keep a check on the hippos, then the waterhole channel is operational. It's under Juma Waterhole. Keep checking out the goings on around Gary Dam, which is this dam here. And if you do have to spot anybody or anything, oh, can you get the heron on the side here? There it goes. There goes the adult being back to the room. see him over there. If anybody does spot anything, please let us know. Okay, it's on the, where the crocodile usually sleeps. It's just on that side, unless he's moved again. Oh, he has moved. Yeah, he was there. That's just very rude. Oh no, he is there. He's just on the bank. Just saw his legs move. <laughs> Quite well camouflaged. Okay. Yeah, he's on this side, next to the water. Yeah, there he is. Just to the right of the screen. A bit further right. There we go. There he is. Okay, still a juvenile, I thought that was the adult. Still had a bit of a green tint, but he go now. Yeah. Okay. A bit shy. 
Let's say quite a difficult one to see. They're fairly common, but you see how well camouflaged they are. Green backed heron. I actually haven't seen any rhino for a while either. I'm definitely going to keep a lookout for some rhino if we can. And I was told by Mark the sticks. Oh. It's a very fresh rhino. Territorial marking there. Sometime yesterday. I say very fresh, it's not like it's just happened. At least the tracks are heading in that direction. But with the males, they turn around. With male rhinos, when they defecate or defecate in their midden, they'll actually kick and that's what you're seeing, those scrape marks. <laughs> so that then gets the scent on their feet and as they walk, that scent gets transferred to wherever it is they're walking, whether it's on the road or in the bush, and that actually helps to mark their territory. And that's how you can tell it's a male. Females don't do that. Females won't bother kicking it. So that's how you can tell if it's a male or female toilet or midden, as we call it. And actually, it's pretty pretty cold as well. It's a pretty cold day but it's still pretty cold. But if you look inside the dung, let's say they are a herbivore and this is quite a lot of goodness that's wasted as well. You can see these large pieces of grass and the white rhino is a pure grazer. So you won't really find anything else in there apart from grass. Whereas with elephants you'll find leaves and twigs and berries and nuts and all sorts of things like that. Sorry guys. So that's how you tell it's white rhino dung. And the fact that they go in the midden, elephants don't do that. Because elephants don't communicate with the dung at all. So in actual fact, apart from waste, dung is a very important substance for animals, say so for marking territory, for passing on information, and if a female wants to mate, then she can't do what the, the b baboons do, because they don't tend to live together. So she's got to leave a calling card behind and say, look, I'm ready to mate, come and find me. And that's exactly what she does. She'll go to a male's midden, and she may actually overlap with a couple of males, so she'll actually decide which male she wants to go for. So she'll go in his midden, and then he will come along, mark his territory, smell that she's been there, and he'll literally put his nose to the ground and follow where she's gone. So if she's walked around a tree grazing, he'll actually follow that scent. And we've actually been lucky enough to see a male rhino when he's been trying to follow a female, and they get very upset when they can't find that trail. It's very funny to watch, and then they'll go off, and they think they found the trail, and they'll come back again, and then try and look for the trail again, and the freshest trail. 
So definitely quite an interesting one to meet, to want to see. But we're going to go up, maybe see if the rhino decide to sleep somewhere a bit further up the road. Who knows? We'll have a look, see where the tracks go. And say sometime yesterday came through here. So Franklin tracks over them already. Another one there. It's quite a, a main one there. Saying, Mark did say that the six females were around here last night, somewhere on Drakensberg and Central Drive. Female lions. I think he cut up through that side. I just want to check in the dip here, and then we'll head up Gary Cupine. They did say they stopped somewhere between Giraffe Dip and the next dip on, and they look north, so maybe we can do a quick loop around here and see if there's any tracks for them. We'll try and head... Ah, I just found some tracks for them. Someone beat me to it. <laughs> Hi, Sheila. Good morning to you. And I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Exactly, I was saying there was something floating on the surface of the water at Gary Dam. It doesn't look very good. And there looks like, I think there's a bit of oil there, it almost looks that sort of substance. I don't know if it's that or whether it's the plants or something or whether there's something else in there. But there was a lot of plants on, I think, I'm still not entirely sure exactly what type of plant it was. Come on, Gunda, make it up the hill. And I'm wondering if it was the knotweed or something like that. I think that died back. And that's possibly the remnants that you're seeing of some of their aquatic plants as well. And the plants themselves have oils. And those oils will also seep into the water. That's why sometimes if you drive past a puddle, especially on the, the side of a road or something where there's a lot of vegetation, sometimes it'll actually be the oil from the, the vegetation rather than cars and things. So maybe you're seeing that possibly on the surface there too. Okay. So, if we go a bit further west, on the fossil cut line, maybe even the fire break, someone else has done the cut line. This is one of the reasons why it's actually quite nice to have other vehicles out, because you need to take different roads. As I say, I was thinking, it sounded like everyone had gone further north. I thought, well, we'll do a big loop and see if we can find something track-wise around there. But they've kind of cut some of that big loop out for us. So by skipping a part, we can get to somewhere else.
had a dream the other night that we saw cheetahs. You never know. <laughs> Some stage. But our rhino might just be lying down in here. Keep a lookout. They do take naps. Especially if it's cool like this. I just find a nice a nice spot where they can just sleep for a little, a little while, somewhere where it's nice and warm. Especially if there's a sandy patch in amongst the bush. They love spots like that. This holds the warmth a little bit longer. Cheryl. <laughs> Wondering why we don't uh, call the rhino in by using its midden. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not a rhino, so I don't think that will work. <laughs> sound to cover distance like lions and leopards do or even hyenas even elephants elephants will use sound to cover distance there's a lot of talking on the radio but there's not too much coming through
the sun coming out. Hello, sun. Missed you. trees are now well, pretty much Sneak in here and see where the rest of the herd are. <laughs> I think there's another one there. There's another one there. Okay, we're going to see if we can go around let's see what's going to be best and go forward and through the bush it's going to be a bit difficult with the sun we'll see how we go well, welcome back everybody we had to leave the kudu though going into the bush just found Oh, and there's another one on the right, so I could hear some movement in the bush there. Oh, and there's a little one, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Good morning, ladies. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Trying desperately hard to keep up with them. They always have something to prove. They turn around and look at you with the ears out. <laughs> sure, there's a lot of youngsters here. There's a few more just on the right. I'm going to just pull forward just slightly. Tell Drongo just sitting there waiting for any insects for him to disturb. Oh, 
There it goes. Looks like her youngest. And there's another one just about to cross the road as well. Slightly older. That one's probably about five or six. And there's one that's probably about eight or nine. See a little bit more independent of its mum. Just in case you missed what the bird was, a fork tailed drongo. You don't often see them sitting on the backs of the animals like the oxpeckers do. They rather sit and wait in trees and wait for any insects that the animals kick up from the grass or from the trees. He's going to take his time so I'm just going to pull forward again a little bit. close to the drongo. Stations have got a Schlambiv and Blob on a Vubu Road. <coughs> Thanks, Anne. <laughs> I do have my tissues here as well. <laughs> I'm sorry for my sniffles this morning. <laughs> Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> now you will see a change in what the elephants go for if you've been watching for a few months now. Some of the more seasonal viewers already have noticed that change with the elephants but when there's a time of plenty when there's enough roots and green leaves and you find the elephants actually oh there's the baby just in front of us now tiny little baby and disappears when they have a lot of green green food you tend to see them eating more 
the leaves and the fruit and the bit of bark as you go into the winter time that's when you'll see them eating a lot more bark and they'll be digging up and looking up a lot of the roots so you'll see them actually using their feet and using their tusks to dig into the ground and pulling up roots a lot more than what you do during the summertime. Again, there's the female doing it right now. See, just scraping her foot on the ground. And they will still eat a bit of grass, but it's more like hay now. So you may even see trees being knocked over so they can get to the roots. I'm going to see if we can drive around again and have a look at them. There's a few family units dotted all over. Actually, let me go see if we can go this way. There's another one over there. I should be moving that way. I should be moving. The unit is sort of moving with the herd, but they're all sort of on their own. And this is how the elephant herds actually make huge herds. You get these family units all coming together and moving as well. All right, lady. And I'm wondering if. That female just in the top left with that very small, that small elephant, probably a few months old now. <laughs> I wonder if she's possibly the daughter of this elephant that we have been following. <laughs> it's so sweet. All the strange smells to get used to following mum, seeing what mum's eating. You see the babies actually putting their mouth into the mother's, uh, sorry, the trunk into the mother's mouths, tasting what they're eating so they can actually learn what it is they can eat. See just about fitting underneath the mother's stomach, so that when they are first born, they fit right underneath the mother's stomach. That gives you an indication of how old they can be. I was saying, I don't think it's probably more than six months old, that one. Texan, Texan, come in. Ah, 
Hi again, Anne. And I'm sorry, I don't have any more information on that elephant that we saw the other day. I think they were still in the area that f the following afternoon and we could hear a trumpeting, but we couldn't hear, we couldn't find them. But um, we think it's possibly that same elephant that Mark saw a few months ago. Um, there was one that couldn't walk very well and apparently there was a bone sticking out of its foot. And... Um, <laughs> Strong goes a chattering away to that elephant. I wonder if we've got a nest in there. A little one going up to possibly its relative. like a, a human child interested in anything and everything <laughs> possibly cousin to the other one <laughs> sniffing what mum's eating now But as I was saying, it is possible that it's the same that the same elephant that he saw a few months ago out on the quarantine area, and the matriarch kept turning around and coming back. And uh, trying to encourage the herd to come back and wait for it. <coughs> Sorry, lady. Now, if that is the case, apparently he was walking better than when Mark last saw it. I think Craig also said that he saw it then. But we haven't seen it since the other morning. We'll certainly keep a lookout for it. As I say, I was really hoping to get a, a better view of it. But at the same time, I didn't want to put pressure on it because they were moving and I was hoping they were going to stop at the water's edge so that we could see them, but they just kept moving, which was saying to me, no, they, they didn't want to be close to us. I'm just going to see if we can squeeze between these trees here.
and you can see a bit of dust coming up from there, so it's something by the roots. Oh dear. Someone not too happy up there. See how many are falling out there. See the fuck coming into play there, trying to scrape away the soil by the looks of it, and possibly even blowing air down his trunk just to try and brush that soil away so he can get to the root. <laughs> it looks like it's a bush willow, bush willow root that he's feeding on. Good morning to you, Francie. I'm wondering what the scariest animal is for me. One of my scariest encounters. Well, I think for me, the scariest lamb mammal, or any mammal actually, is human. And I'm not just saying that, I actually do mean that. I find it very scary what humans can do, and what they're capable of. And I think that's that's the difference with humans and other animals. In that there's there's always a reason why animals do things. They don't. I, I'll never believe an animal does things out of spite. There's always a reason behind it. I suppose the same could be said for humans, but I don't know. Funny things that go off in our heads sometimes, I think. Animal-wise, probably one of the most scariest moments, or heart-stopping moments, is, is probably with the big bull elephants. And when they are in must, because they, they become the most unpredictable, I think, for me. You're never quite sure which side of the fence you might be sitting on. And I think having bulls in must is, is the say, probably one of those when he looks at you, it's like, which way is he going to go? I think at the moment I've actually been relatively lucky in that the bull elephants who have been in must have actually been very relaxed. And let me just see if we can turn a little bit more this way. And it does come down to respecting the bush and respecting the animals, and they do pick up on that. They do pick up on your body language and things like that. And I think that does help. There's some more elephants up here. I'm just going to go a little bit further in and just see. I think that female's going to also come this way. Let's see our other female with the baby again. Spring up, it's quite a flexible tree. And that one's going to cause a little bit of damage to it. Maybe. Thank you. 
And good morning to you, Dawn. I'm bored this morning. I don't think we're going to get another view of the elephant herd. There's a couple more family units up here, too. I'm wondering when a baby elephant is born, does the rest of the herd move off if they stay? And they'll tend to protect that little baby because, especially for the first few days, it's going to be very wobbly on those legs. Females might actually choose quite a sheltered spot and try and get in between these two trees and then they can stop just here. There's another family just there. And then just taking it very steady, very easy. A lot of females with youngsters here, but they've not really lifted their heads or really been watching us. You will find a lot of the breeding or matings will actually happen during the rainy season, during the summer time. But they can breed throughout the year. You do get this peak around the summer time. You will get quite a number of births around the summer time also. The gestation period being one of the longest, in fact probably the longest of all the mammals, being 22 months. I forget which reptile it is. There's a reptile that's about three and a half years gestation period. Quite a small, small reptile too. Quite amazing. It actually has a longer gestation period than one of the largest mammals on the planet. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just wondering if there's a female that is an estrus, because this bull in front of us, even though he looks quite a young bull, he looks old enough to have left the herd. So he may have been drawn in, maybe there's a female that's in estrus and she's ready to mate. But what you do find is that the females won't always accept the youngsters or even the first males that come along. They might wait for the more impressive bulls to respond. fancies the company. <laughs> just gonna move just a little bit further into this gap here. And then we shall continue on.
that was quite interesting is that females will also have quite a settling power over the males and even when the males get quite boisterous the presence of the females can help to settle them <laughs> look at this little one trying to copy mum trying to wrap its trunk around the branch but not quite getting it right And just like the legs, they have to learn to use that trunk. It's not something that they know exactly how to use. further into the bush there. Let's see if there's any more coming this side. There's a couple more. moved up already as well. Never mind. It's still great just to sit and relax as they're having breakfast. She was actually here as we drove up. Oh, she must have found something very tasty. Hello. Yeah, she's not too sure about us. Oh, 
Hi, Laurie. Good to hear from you this morning. Uh, this female's relaxed a little bit. You can see her whole posture was very different to the other females. She wasn't too sure of us. That's why I kept our distance as soon as she lifted up her head. And let her come to us. And come and check us out. But she just looked a little bit more nervous than me, the other females. And soon, just to say, lifting up that head that slight head shake as well and again that's just a, a respect that I was saying to her okay I understand you don't want us too close to you you don't want us to come and see you so we just stay keep our distance and you can see she's like oh okay that's cool I can see you're listening to us I'm gonna go on my own way now <laughs> But Laurie, a little bit confused about bulls being in must, and do they need to be in must to breed? Do they come into must at the same time as the females? And every male will be different. And males will tend to come into must once a year or so, but it can last a few days, it can last a few months. It really just depends on that individual. And that gives them an advantage over males that aren't in must, and it, it does give them that edge that they want to breed, and they will go and search out females who are in estrus and those those males could be quite a distance from the females so it can it can be that females when they come into estrus that they don't mate now, they, they may stay in estrus for maybe two to six days and if they don't mate within that period then they may cycle a couple of months later or even just a few weeks later but when bulls are in must, it just gives them that edge over bulls that aren't in must and they become a lot more aggressive. I mentioned this was saying to you um, earlier and the fact that when a bull is in must, they're a little bit more unpredictable because they have a lot more aggression uh, with them and they, they are, they've got a lot of testosterone running around their body which does make them a lot more aggressive. So if there is a male that's not in must, he will give way to that, that bull that is a must and he will say go and actually try and mate with the females. Now I've not seen or, or read that males that aren't in must won't go or, or they will go to females that are in estrus. I, I don't think they would but maybe if there is a male that happens to be with the females for whatever reason maybe that could trigger him to be coming, uh, going to must. But um, generally, you don't find the older bulls with females unless they are in must. That's why I'm quite interested to see why that other male. He didn't smell like he was in, in must. He didn't look like he was in must. But we were actually just next to where he was digging for roots and things like that. And it smells quite strong. So maybe he's just on the early onset of must. He just happened to come across this female herd. There's a lot of flies around here too. But as I say, it gives them the edge and other bulls will actually move out the way and if the females don't have a male that's in, in must with them they'll often give this call and it's called an estrus chorus and the females will join in and it's a specific call and other males that are in the area will be able to hear it they'll be able to sense the vibrations on the ground from it as well and that will actually draw them in and usually the females that are in the herd will actually join in now females not gone too far away so I'm just gonna, just gonna turn around and if we do get another view of her if she's relaxed otherwise we shall move on and I think bulls in must actually are more desirable to the females and I don't I can't see them accepting a bull that's not in must say they do get quite picky, picky and the females if they've got female calves who've not been mated before and they come into estrus for the first time they will actually choose a mate for her and they may actually stay with her during the matings it's going to be quite daunting especially for a young female who may be 14 16 now she's moving off so i'm going to leave her i'm going to leave her to it <clears throat> so, female 
could be maybe 14, 16, 18 years old. And she's probably still going to be quite small, especially compared to some of the big bulls. And we've seen some huge bulls here over the summer. I'm absolutely astounded at some of the sizes of some of these bulls. And sometimes they will actually mate in the water, and that will also help the female take the weight of the male. And he says she's been copying me, the Shlamy of Ndlov are slowly fambering east from Ndugu Road, now quite far into the Shlati. to listen to the radio too much but not from what I have heard. I think the only thing was someone calls us from the Gala uh, Fabring West towards Sydney, Sydney's Dam on the Hook Cut Line. Yeah, okay. <coughs> There's quite a distance between these elephants and the other elephants we were looking at. As I say, they're probably... <coughs> and probably... Ah, so there's a female that looks like she could be an oestrus. The temporal gland is weeping. See that little one that's with her. And as I was saying earlier, they do use sound to keep in contact, and even they could be talking right now. But unfortunately, again, it's inaudible to us. It's very low frequency sounds. But they could still be chatting away. And even the vibration through the ground. And they've actually have found... There was an experiment done, I think, in Botswana. Oh, sorry. I want to try and move, but she was just a little bit... As soon as we pulled in, that's why I just wanted to stop here. And she actually went back to feeding, so she's okay. They were watching a herd of elephants and all of a sudden one of them gave an alarm call and all the elephants actually crowded together and protected the little ones that were actually inside that formation. And then the matriarch decided to flee. And as I say, quite interesting the way they, uh, the way they actually did that. And they played the same alarm call to a herd of elephants elsewhere, and exactly the same behaviour happened. So, this was a, a standard alarm call that was given. And they, they did it a few times, and the, the same behaviour was seen each time. Later on, they actually did research and found that elephants were also communicating with vibration. So when they, they produce a sound, the vibration goes through the body and down into the ground as well and they can actually detect that with their feet. I'm going to see if she will. I'm just going to turn on and see how she reacts because I'm just going to try and pull forward slightly and hopefully she will allow us to see her a little bit better. Still feeding lady. She's still feeding. I 
I think a few a few years later, the next step was to actually play that alarm call and play it underneath. They actually put the microphone underneath the ground so that no sound could be heard, but it could be felt under the ground. And what they found was, again, exactly the same behavior was seen as they played this sound through the ground. And it's thought that these vibrations, the elephants can actually detect these vibrations many kilometers away. <laughs> Maybe that little one's going to come and join his mum again. No, I'll take the shortcut. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's see if we can head off towards Impala Plains. See if there is anything for us to find that side. copied about the Schlamm moving blob on the river road. There's still some around Archie or around River Road. Most of them are from the east. Have you managed to find anything from the Ingala around Sydney's down? Uh, not yet. Uh, the Copy that, sir. Have you checked your Lego shortcut or do they carry on uh, beyond there? Sorry folks, we're going to have to quickly change the battery, don't go too far. Never get curious. Some more in parlor, just in the bushes here. Do they come up, up to the vehicle and what would I do if they did? And again, it's sometimes they do, sometimes it really is just who are you, what you were about, and then they'll come right up to the vehicle and you don't do anything, you just enjoy the moment. And as I say, there are there are times when you you know something's not quite right. So that animal's not responding too well. And sometimes they will take offence to you. Sometimes maybe you've done something wrong. And you don't realise it. Sometimes maybe you haven't done something wrong. They're just having a bad day. Maybe something put them on edge, like a predator in the area. And I have had an occasion where an elephant did did charge us, and it was 
It was odd. It wasn't a. It wasn't a warning charge. Sometimes it's called a mock charge. Call it a mock or a warning charge. I prefer warning because they are warning you. It was. It had elements of a warning charge, and it also had elements of a real charge. But it was. It was neither. It was parts of both. It was very odd. And I could see that the herd was very uneasy and they were quite a distance into the bush and they were looking around and I think something, a predator or something, must have been around. And they were just very much on edge. So we pulled in and I actually I kept my distance. So I thought, well, I don't want to put pressure on them. Let's just see what they do and how they go. And one female Took, took it upon herself to actually try and chase us off. And the herd kind of slowly came came towards us, still a good 80 meters or so away from us, maybe 70, 80 meters. And she started coming closer and closer, and I thought, this, something's not quite right with this one. And she had to come and look at the hippos. <laughs> say a quick hello, but we'll keep going. But she, um, she kept coming and she had to come around some trees and I think that slowed her down and something said to me just talk to her I don't know what it was but I just thought oh, if I shout it might just make matters worse so I just talked to her and she actually stopped probably about a meter and a half from us and I think then she realized you know we don't mean her any harm but for some reason she's going to her head she just was trying to tell us to back off and then she actually relaxed down and actually the whole herd started relaxing a little bit it was very odd <laughs> I'm starting to enjoy the sun <laughs> see one or two ox peckies on the back there but for the any animal actually coming up to the vehicle it's just curiosity and you just let them carry on and just find out what it is they need to know but as soon as an animal especially the carnivores if they actually put paws onto the vehicle or you know really starts taking interest then you do have to kind of intervene for the sake of that animal <laughs> look at this <laughs> Two youngsters playing. There's one of the little ones just behind them, actually. Okay, let's leave them to it. If you want to keep a watch on the hippos, there is the Juma waterhole camera. Yeah. <laughs> yes, as I was saying about the carnivores, sometimes you may get one or two that get a little bit too curious. And it's good for them to know kind of what the vehicle's about because then they, they move alone and they kind of realize okay well this is nothing that harms me I don't need to really interfere with it and that's how we can actually do what we do driving around with lions and leopards and elephants and things like that we try not to interfere with their lives too much but if we had a leopard say putting its paw up here that's just getting a little bit too inquisitive and who's to say next time they won't put two paws up and jump in or jump onto a vehicle full of guests and that's when it, it may become a problem just from that first, that first
first instance. So if, if the carnival does that, then we do have to intervene. Maybe just start the engine or roll the vehicle forward or do something because if that animal gets to the stage where they might start jumping on vehicles then unfortunately that animal has to has to be removed which is obviously what we don't want so we've got to keep that balance between human and animal in that especially the, the, the dangerous animals you don't want to have that crossover with that kind of invisible line of respect. So a car just here on the left. We had a nice little one this morning, so we're going to keep going. And as I say, it is for the sake of the animal. It's not not necessarily through fear or anything of that of, of the guide, but it is. You can foresee, okay, if this animal is doing this, then there is a possibility it's going to do this, this and this, and it is going to become a danger. get away with quite a lot. I went to Kruger just for a couple of hours. Kruger from here is about seven seven kilometers but for us to actually go and visit Kruger it probably takes us about an hour to get there. So I went through Open Gate, which is our closest gate. And the first thing that I find is actually a bull elephant and he's just chilling on the side of the road. He's eating and he was actually he was so relaxed. He was a beautiful beautiful old man and he was just relaxing watching the wheel go by so I stopped a little distance from him and I was absolutely astounded at how many people passed him and couple with such speed I was just absolutely gobsmacked and he barely battled an eyelid so I took it in his stride thankfully I say sometimes you do hear of elephants doing things and as I say what you've always got to remember is what, what have they had in the past and even for other animals what's happened in the, in the past for them to react like that and I always think there's a story behind the story and quite often we don't know the full story as I say I was quite amazed Have a look. So apparently the tracks of those lioness carried on west towards Sydney's now. It's, it sounds like the other guys are possibly following up there, so we're going to cover another area. I was hoping our rider might pop out. As I say, it could have been that he carried on elsewhere or just stayed in that block. It's 
there a season for terrapins? I haven't seen them much lately. And I was actually commenting on that this morning myself. I remember last year we used to see the terrapins on the backs of the hippos so much. And yet this year we haven't really seen them too much. Maybe it's been a combination of factors. So we have had a few problems with the waterhole camera. Maybe it's because we haven't really seen them out and about. Um, actually, we haven't really had that many hippos here. This is only really recently they've moved in properly. Maybe that had something to do with it as well. Sorry, more girls. But during the winter time, you find that the, the terrapins will tend to find themselves a nice ready spot. Go and rest in there. Oh, we've got a drag mark here. Well, silly days like this, I might just come out of that murder and come and sunbathe. Oh, hyenas. Hyenas drag something. snakes during the winter time they tend to find themselves a nice little hole to go and hide in and they might just come out and bask for a little while somewhere close to that hole but during the summer and the hotter times of the year you'll find that they actually move around a lot more you find snake tracks across the road and things like that and say hello quickly to the hyenas see if the dead are still active that wasn't aware, the hyenas have actually moved den sites. Remember they were using den on Philemon's cut line. And they've moved to here.
getting a very big soft spot for hyenas. And quite unusual that meat's been brought back to the den. It's not often done. But I think these pups all belong to, I think, probably the first, second and third in charge. smallest one possibly to one of these mothers here I didn't notice any distinguishing features <laughs> 